Hello, everybody. Welcome to the show and welcome to episode 101. Okay, everybody, we're back again. Um, you know, kind of in a weird mood today, but, you know, I'll get through it. Just kind of, uh, you know, it's trying to stay positive and all that. And, um, you know, again, the podcast is one of the things that kind of gets me through it because of just doing good and, and meeting so many uh, inspiring people. And uh, our next guest I found, I believe, through Facebook, and we just started talking. And, you know, we kind of had a lot of similarities in certain ways and, uh, you know, again, like I said, it's just about people who are struggling and trying to overcome. Uh, it's, you know, you really don't know what's going on in the world because you, you see what you see and you hear what you hear, but you don't really, you know, you don't get like a vivid imagery or like a deep insight to someone's mind until someone actually just is comfortable enough to saying, hey, this is what I go through and these are the thoughts I have. And then her and I were having these conversations and you know, I guess she, some of the things I said, she never really heard it put certain ways because a lot of people aren't so open, especially about, you know, mental health and, um, you know, and it's, it's why people need to look out and reach out for each other or reach out and look, look out for each other because, you know, it's a lonely world. Um, so, uh, again, I found her and, and, you know, we had a really great conversation and we're becoming friends as we, we go on. And, um, so you want to, you know, introduce yourself. And I know you said you also wanted to explain something as well. Um, yeah, my name is Sarah. I am 49 years old. I think though one of the biggest things that describes me is the fact that I have three kids. Um, they're all grown. And another thing I think that has always described myself is my work ethic. And I had worked at the post office for 26 years until a few years ago when I started to struggle um, with the physicalness of the job, with Amazon and everything. And I just, uh, you know, wasn't feeling good enough for the working six days a week and the physical stresses. So um, I quit the only job I've really known as an adult. Um, and since then, within the last year, I was diagnosed with Meniere's disease in both ears and um, was actually fired from my job last November. So it's been a year um, since I was uh, you know, fired from my job and, and diagnosed with double Meniere's, uh, bilateral Meniere's disease. And I have been at home um, not working in the last year. You want to tell people what Meniere's disease is? Um, Meniere's disease, first of all, it's not common to have it in both ears, but Meniere's disease is a vertigo, uh, attacks of vertigo uh, caused by extra fluid held in your ears, basically. So I, you cannot have um, salt. Like I have to have less than 1,000 milligrams of salt a day no caffeine, alcohol, or nicotine, things like that. Anything that stores liquid in your body, when you have Meniere's disease, that liquid, for some reason, goes straight to your ears. Mm -hmm. And your ears are where your vertigo is in your ears. So um, my ears fill up with um, fluid. If I eat anything with a lot of salt, you know, any caffeine, anything like that. And, and a lot of times just like right now because of the, the season and it causes severe vertigo and that vertigo, um, it causes severe dizziness to where I, I can't even touch the ground sometimes. And sometimes it's just, you know, the ground is a little uneven, but the vertigo causes, you know, obviously causes nausea. It causes you to throw up. Um, is it like you're like your whole and equilibrium it, is just like off? It's gone. Like I, if for me, it can be anywhere from a little bit of a dizzy feeling. Like I said, my ground will be crooked. Um, right now, when I say it's the season for my Meniere's, I mean, for some reason, November, um, gosh, it seems to be all but four months of the year, honestly, when I'm struggling with some allergies or, you know, the rain or whatever, 
anything, um, it, it, it causes me to have vertigo all the time, but in a smaller manner. So where my ground is just crooked, right? Mm-hmm. So I'm always feeling off, never stable. But when I have the um, large vertigo attacks, it is like I'm sitting in a chair and um, inside of a Rubik's Cube. And my chair is not moving, but the Rubik's Cube is being thrown across the ground where it's tumbling over and over. And I can't even find the ground. Wow. Um, you can't move because you, you, you don't know where anything's at. You're disoriented. And so it also causes you to start throwing up. Um, and also it, it causes a, a severe diarrhea at the same time. Um, so you're spinning out of control you're throwing up, you know, all these things are happening and it's very confusing. And these attacks can last from, you know, two minutes to, um, 24 hours, you know, um, fluctuating in, um, intensity throughout the attack. And then they cause you to have severe, you're, you're just severely exhausted after the attack. And it could be, you know, for a day, for a week. Um, I was in bed for three months. I think three months was the longest time I went without having, without having days that started to come in between where I had good days where I could get up and the floor was just a little crooked and I could eat and, you know, hmm. wow. Yeah. I'd be I, normal. No, yeah. I mean, there, there was a woman at work that has it and she would leave a lot and I never, yeah. I, I didn't know much about it. And my, I found my mom has vertigo, but it, it seems to be in a much smaller case. She doesn't, I mean, she right. had it a few times just show up and, um, yeah, it seems like really debilitating and just kind of, yeah, it cripples you in a way. And uh, I'm like, I, I didn't know much about it. Cause again, there's so many, right. you know, even with this, I try to cover so many conditions and sometimes they come out of nowhere and I'm like, I have no idea what that is. Of course I'd like to, yeah. you know, learn and, you know, let people know. Cause there's, you know, it seems like every year is this new conditions coming out. I mean, I'm not saying vertigo is new, but you know, it's, it's yeah. to learn about them cause there's so many. Um, and so, yeah. so is vertigo and rare? Then you- um, Meniere's, okay, so there's vertigo and then there's Meniere's disease because there could be other reasons that you have vertigo. Okay. There's other diseases, other causes for vertigo. Um, but Meniere's is something, it causes, also causes hearing loss every time you have an attack. Right. So, um, it's not something that usually just comes on once and goes away. There are people, there are a lot of people that have Meniere's um, and they, they just, they, they control it with diet for, so for most it's under 2000 milligrams a day, but for me it's under a thousand milligrams a day, which is not a lot of people know a piece of pizza <laughs> right, okay. um, is a thousand milligrams up to, I mean, all the way up. I mean, um, there are just aisles at the grocery store that I can no longer ever, ever have again. You know, yeah. um, I was just looking up Popeye's chicken with my husband because we just got a Popeye's chicken in town okay, yeah. and I think it was 1,520 milligrams for one Popeye's chicken, chicken breast. Wow. So, <laughs> um, a lot of people are able to look at the salt and stop the alcohol and nicotine and caffeine and be on some of the medications and be okay. And the medicine controls it. If the medicine medicine controls it, obviously you can go to work, you can live a normal life. And also you're not going to face um, being deaf. Right. Because just having Meniere's doesn't cause the deafness. It's, it's each attack that you have. Okay start causing you to be a little more deaf. And I have um, what they consider moderate hearing loss in my right ear already. And um, I have a mild hearing loss in my left ear right now. Okay. And um, I'm 49 years old. So eventually I'm going to go deaf. Well, what I get, I mean, again, a lot of this is pretty new, right? Because again, you said you're 49. Yeah. When, when did all this actually start? Okay, so I've had here I've had problems in my right ear 
since I was a child okay. in both my ears, my left ear a little bit. So I've had like three or four tubes put in my right ear and maybe one or two in my left. Um, as a child, I had severe uh, ear infections because it, it was called, it's called, um, I never can say this word, right? But it's something to do with its fascia tubes and they, mine did not tilt to drain. So I couldn't get water. I couldn't go swimming. Every time I went swimming, I got an ear infection. You know, I couldn't even take a bath and put my head under the water. I would get an ear infection and the ear infection over and over. And then it would cause fluid in my ear and they would put a tube in my ear. And I remember, you know, being under the coffee table a lot as a kid. Uh, spinning and having weird dreams. And I think it was, I honestly think it was, you know, my Meniere's as a child, but, you know, they say it is very uncommon to have Meniere's as a child, but they also say it's uncommon for it to be in both ears. It used to be like it was not, you know, it was impossible for it to be in two ears. Right. And now it's just uncommon. And, you know, I have it in both ears. So I really think it started as a kid, but um, it went away as an adult for, I started swimming, you know, being able to take showers and stuff like that. And they had said that it's a possibility that when I grew taller, um, my tubes would uh, turn, you know, and start draining and I would be able to go swimming and stuff. So I just assumed all of that was in the past. I had ear infections here and there, but nothing big, no big deal. And then I would say about two, a little over two years ago, uh, we went out to Tucson to visit my husband's brother and we went and swimming. Mm -hmm. And um, for a good year, I was going, you know, I didn't have insurance, health insurance. Um, I was going from... Uh, little clinic to little clinic, you know, every time I had an ear infection and I had gone to the same one a few times. And finally somebody was like, you know, you have a lot of extra fluid in your ears. Let's give you some prednisone, some other things. And that continued to happen. And they were like, we're not going to continue to treat your ear infection. And I was confused. They said, you needed to go to an ear specialist. So they thought that I had some sort of, ear problems right. above my, you know, and I didn't have the medicine to go, the insurance to go to a specialist. Um, and so things started to get worse and worse. I started getting dizzy. I, I thought it was for a while uh, when I started getting dizzy and throwing up, I thought it was a new uh, depression medication I was put on. Um, that was causing those problems. So I got off of that, you know, went through a couple of them thinking it was medication. Um, at this point I was working, um, at a company that, uh, gives care to the elderly. I was an office person there. And, um, one of my close friends of 20 years, I guess it was, it was my boss, the president of the company. I had called out a little bit, uh, cause I was dizzy and throwing up and I, I just couldn't figure out what was going on. And I had decided to go to the ER, which, um, you don't have health insurance. Going to the ER means like, I feel like I'm dying. Okay. Right, yeah. <laughs> cause I don't, I don't go to the doctors or to the ER. I mean, when you walk in the ER, you know, it's thousands of dollars. And, um, the minute I walked in the ER, I was fired. Um, and, I went to the ER twice and one of the ladies there said, Hey, listen, I think you have an ear disease and you really need to go see an ear, nose and throat. I'm going to recommend you go there. And, um, well, before, before you continue on, like one of the things with, uh, again, I have good insurance, but I've looked at my, my bills. Um, they end up getting covered, but when I look at them and you see the prices of everything, you know, blood pressure uh -huh. and, and all that. And one of the things they do is, you know, obviously you're going in there for something, but then they start going, oh, let's do blood work and let's do this and let's do that. And they start adding oh, yeah. shit on and you look at your bill uh -huh. and it's like $10,000 or something ridiculous. Or just even if it's like 2000, it's like, geez, like 
how did it get to this point? Especially like if you say, you know, because I ha- was having a lot of anxiety, panic attacks and stuff. And it's like, okay, we better do blood work, heart. make sure he's not on drugs. <laughs> we better check his heart, you know, do all these right. CAT scans and do all this and that. And it just, and, yeah. you, and you're just like, dude, I came in here for this. Like, can you just like give me something to kind of calm me down and we'll, we'll be good. Um, right. And, and yeah, and if you don't have insurance, yeah. like that really bites you in mm-hmm. the ass because, it, you know, your prices go, oh, your, your your bill goes way up. It was ten thousand dollars for my first visit. Yeah, exactly. There, okay. I was making fourteen dollars an hour. <laughs> right. I mean, that is half of my year's income. Right, like fourteen dollars an hour is decent for the average person living. But yeah, I mean, you're getting you not know. here in Arizona. Here in Arizona, I'm paying right now. We are paying fifteen hundred dollars a month for a three bedroom, two bath duplex. Okay. Right. Yeah. So fourteen dollars an hour is eight. It, I, my checks were about seven fifty, eight hundred dollars every two weeks. Yeah. That's rent. My entire check is rent. Right. Right. Yeah. So, um, where I live in the area I live, utilities have been proven to be even higher. You know, APS bills two fifty. You know, average. Um. It's just very high cost of living right now. There's a housing crisis in the area that we're living in right now. Um, So $14 an hour is not not a lot of money. And it depends on it also depends on your state like minimum wage because like I know California just went up to fifteen, but they have to. Fifteen is really not that big of a deal. Whereas like here I live in Pennsylvania, our minimum wage is seven fifty, which is ridiculous. Right. Exactly. Ours is now twelve fifty an hour. Okay. Okay. So fourteen dollars an hour is dollar fifty over minimum wage, and I'm going out to people's houses and interviewing them and assessing their 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 needs to be taken care of, and I'm making a you know that, that's besides the point. But yeah, I'm not making a lot of money, right. and um, so for me to go to the ER is a big deal, and and my boss to think that I was doing that just to get out of work for the day. So, yeah, I'm going to get out of working my eight-hour shift at $14 an hour so that I can go across the street and get a $10,000 bill just to get out of day's work, you know? Yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, that's insanity. That That's just insanity. And from somebody, somebody that was very close to me, and I know this might not seem relevant to a lot of people, but this, this is one thing I went through just because, you know, I didn't have health insurance and I wasn't feeling good and I, and I was scared and I went to the ER and even though my, my boss was a friend of over 20 years, I got fired from that, for that. And it ended up actually being a blessing that I got fired. Um, the supervisor that I worked with at the, under that she worked over at the time, um, she sent me an email um, stating the date of, termination and everything for me when I asked for it because she thought that I was wrongly fired, didn't agree, didn't agree with uh, the other lady. So I, in it was that email that ended up, um, that piece of information I needed that I submitted for the unemployment that I ended up winning the case. <laughs> so by her firing me, I got about six months, or seven months of unemployment, oh, that's nice. um, which saved us as a household, you know, right. in being able to pay our rent and stuff. Um, and then I was able to qualify for access and get health insurance. Right. Well, that's one of the things, um, you know, because there's a lot of people talk about just how people with disabilities, you know, 75% of us are employed and there, there's a you know, theory on how lazy we are and all that. And again, there are some of us that are lazy, but there's also, you know, when it comes to, you know, they're starting to really crack down on when it comes to race and gender and all that, as far as discrimination. But when it comes to us, there's some things that are like subliminal and only we can kind of understand what you're saying to us Mm -hmm. and how you're mistreating us. Yeah. But we can't, we can't prove it really unless you know what it's like to be us. And, and when people say certain yeah. lingo and certain things, you just go like, Oh, I know why you're firing. You're going to say it's because of this and that. But the reality is I know mm-hmm. the real reason. Um, and, and that's, again, that's why I like doing this because it's, there's, 
that more people need to know how hard it is to even find a job or keep a job as a person with a disability. Um, Mm -hmm. And there's so much embarrassment of going out even just in the market and trying to find one, knowing you're going to get rejected Mm -hmm. so many times over. And I know a lot of people are going to say, well, yeah, I mean, I have full able capabilities in my body and I get rejected. It's like, it's not the same. It's, you know, as soon as I throw on the table, Hey, I'm legally blind. It's, it's almost like the interview's over. Right. Yeah. And that's what, so I can't work right now. Okay. And I've worked since I was 14. That's why I say in my introduction of part of who I was, am, is I have, I worked since I was 14. I had three kids. I was a single parent for a very large part of that. I was the breadwinner. I worked at the post office for 26 years. Okay. So I was making 20 some dollars an hour and I took care of my family. That's what I did. That was my, that was me. That was a big part of me, my personality, who, who I am, you know? Mm. And I never realized that until I got fired and I can't work. I, I don't, I don't drive a whole lot. Um, if I feel good, I drive. If I don't, I, I don't because I mean, you don't want to be in the car and then all of a sudden have it start spinning, oh, toppling over you, you know? Right. Um, so, I mean, I haven't had my driver's license pulled, but um, that's a possibility. Uh, a lot of times when you have many years that's untreated, um, I, I, I mean, not untreated. I, I treat it with the medication and diet and all those things, but it doesn't control my many years. Right. Um, but how, it like, helps it. Because, uh, like, you and I have a lot of parallels. Because mine started from an ear infection, and, and mm-hmm. there's a lot of parallels here. But mm-hmm. one, the one real major opposite is that mine all happened to me when I, well, I mean, a lot of it happened to me when I was a kid, when it mainly started. So I had uh-huh. time to kind of just evolve and develop and figure out what I'm going to be and, and how I'm, you know, mm-hmm. I was four when it happened. So. I didn't really know what life was like anyway. So now I'm just in hurting and now all of a sudden my eyes don't work as much, but I didn't understand life anyway. But as a person who's now in the forties and you had a, you know, a a decent part of your life already go by and you're used to what you're used to. Now you had little problems that you didn't really know what they were, what they stemmed from. But how is it like as as a person who's now, you know, obviously you're mature, you're a person in your own, you're comfortable in your life. And now tragedy just comes out of nowhere and just shifts the whole boundary of what you or, you know, everything you've known is now different. Mm-hmm. That's the reason I'm on your show right now. Like that's the reason that I'm trying to reach out is I cannot even put into words, um, going from an able bodied woman who person, human being who, you know, defined herself by work and what she had to give, always giving, always the one that Kate takes care of everybody else to, being the one sitting on the couch, not be able to move, not being able to go to work. Everybody in the entire house leaves every day for work. And I'm at home um, with this new thing going on, scared to death, honestly, scared to death. Um, there were times where I had these attacks where I wanted to call 911 because I was dehydrated. It's been hours, you know, I was sewing everything up, all these things. And and you're, I felt useless, hopeless, useless. Um, sometimes it got so bad. I just didn't want to be here anymore. Um, right. <clears throat> not, not just physically, but mentally, you know, mentally, I, um, I have gone through some depression in my life and different stages of my life. I've been, I have dealt with being on some depression medications. Um, honestly, looking back, I probably should have just stayed on them. I shouldn't have just gotten off and got on. Um, but you know, there's a stigma and people hear you're on depression medication and some, you get one of two things of, yeah, like, oh, you're depressed. You know, I'm sad sometimes too, too. Um, while you're on depression medications, like you're crazy. Should my kid, you know, be able to come over to your kid's house and visit? Are you going to like take care of them? You know, just just a really big gamut of, of, um, responses that you could get, you know? And 
Um, so I would go off of them when I feel better. And I've just struggled my entire life um, with a lot of things that I'm afraid, I was afraid to talk about. And it all came crashing down when I'm home, you know, at home, I cannot work. I cannot hold a job. I, uh, for a large part of it, would stress out that I would even be able to make it to my next doctor's appointment, you know, um, large periods of time where I didn't leave my house at all, except for, for doctor appointments. Um, like I said, and they stressed me out. Yeah. And it got it got so bad. The depression got so bad that I I'm actually um you know checked myself in to a mental hospital here locally um because I didn't know who I was. I didn't know why I was here. I didn't know what my purpose was. I felt worthless. I felt lost, scared, sick all the time. You know. Yeah. Um. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're kind of, one of the things that I've discussed on here so many times is one of the things people don't realize with people with disabilities, like, I think you don't realize how quickly you can become disabled. Like, it, it just seems yeah. like a lot of people just think like, oh, you got cancer or, oh, you know, you were born yeah. that way or whatever. But right. like, even if you're disabled, you're one bad incident away from being disabled times two. Like, and yes. you can, yes. and you're like the perfect poster girl for that. Mm-hmm. Where it's like you're living this life, mm-hmm. even though there was little things within there to give you signs of what maybe was to come. But right, your life was already content. You already were working. You already mm-hmm. have a husband and, and kids, and and you got everything right. going on. You got basically the life that a lot of people want to live. And then all of a sudden, shit just goes left, mm-hmm. and now your life is totally different. When it's it, it's not like you didn't yes. get into a car accident. You, you know, you didn't get shot yeah. or. You know, whatever right. didn't come to, it's just everything just went, right. and now your life you have to adapt to a life that you have no idea what. I mean, maybe now you have an idea of it, but you had no idea even what. Probably didn't even know much about Meniere's disease or any of it. Now you got to look yeah. it up, and you got to you have to have yeah. the right doctors, and and your life is just turned mm-hmm. upside down. It doesn't mean you know your life is over, obviously, but it just no. Again, like that's why I think, in a way, I think it, it's much harder for someone like you. Whereas, like I said, I was I wasn't born into it, but I was might as well have been because I was four. Um, right. Whereas you, like you said, your life was content, and now it's flipped upside down, and now you have yeah. to try to pick up everything that you uh-huh. knew from before. You have to throw uh-huh. it out. Yeah, yeah. It's almost so. Uh, we went. Me and my husband went from. Having the uh, $10,000 in the bank for the deposit on a, to buy a home to um, be honest with you, well, that was gone, you know, um, just the first few. Um, I, I was able to get to one specialist appointment and, and, um, and had a bunch of blood tests run at my regular doctor that we paid for it was cash before I got fired and before I was able to get on access. So all of our savings, you know, went from $10,000 in savings for to buy a home to where we're at now, where we actually just, I just got my rent paid for three months to the government for, for rental assistance because I'm not working. Um, the only way I could keep my unemployment is if I had the um, old boss of mine, a friend of 20 years, write a letter saying that she broke the law by firing me because she found out I went across the street to the hospital and they were COVID testing me. Mm-hmm. So I had to prove that I was fired because of COVID. And the only way to do that was have her write that letter. Well, who's going to write a letter incriminating themselves to keep me on unemployment, right? right. <laughs> Nobody. That's the only way I could keep it. So, I, I mean, I can't work. I am... Um, I have a soap business that I'm running um, that has cost me more money than it has made. You know, when you're starting a new business, it's not about making money in the beginning. So we're still struggling and pushing to run that business. And, and um, every day that I wake up that I feel good, that's what you'll find me doing is running, you know, making my soap and all those things. Um, but it, right now it's not something that makes us, you know, an income. Right. Well, so, when when it comes to, like, this is where, I mean, you know, I remember going into the Social Security building one time and, and 
I, just the way I was treated and looked at it and, and you perceived oh, yeah. to be this person, like you're just, you're just collecting money because you're lazy. And, uh-huh. you know, and I interviewed someone uh-huh. recently who has to use a, a scooter and you know, she, she's very, was very insecure about it at one point because mm-hmm. you know, a lot of girls, a lot of people, especially, you know, a lot of people who get, they just will eat themselves into a chair and now they have this right. scooter because they were too lazy and right. people enabled them. And so there's this constant battle for, for people like you and I and others who are, are overcoming and maybe we're on so secu- social security or we can't work or we can't do certain things. And mm-hmm. we get kind of wrapped in with the others, the, 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 the smaller minority of them who are literally created their own disability by, like I said, eating or whatever. And, and they're lazy and that they, all they want is social security and all they want, because when you look yeah. at, you look at the whole format of disability and all that, like they, they basically are encouraging you not to work based on all the restrictions. And, and, and then when you look at the job market and people, well, you know what they are hiring, you know, you're mm-hmm. not, they never will ever consider you. And, and it, it's, it's a trap mm-hmm. and it's really, I know a lot of times, sometimes it sounds like excuses when it comes from some of us where it's just like, well, I can't work. It's like, well, you don't understand. Forget, forget your just actual issues and your actual chronic pain and all that. Like, yeah, that's, that's one thing, but there's so many other hurdles that go with it. And the system mm-hmm. is so set up for you to fail. And again, it's set up for a lot of people to fail, not just people with disabilities, but people with disabilities really get the worst end of it. Cause I think people think, well, okay, you get seven, $800, a thousand dollars a month. Here you go. That, that should take care of it. It's like, dude, like, didn't you just hear her say she has to pay $1,500 for rent? Like, that doesn't cover shit. That, that covers my rent, right. but it doesn't cover any of my groceries, doesn't cover my internet, doesn't cover my phone. Right. It doesn't cover me to buy any things that I would like to just in, so I can enjoy my life, like podcast equipment. And, you know, and that's right. So when you hear people like you tell your story, you know, you can kind of, I can hear where I, you know, of course we always have those negative thoughts in the back of our mind. You can hear the person just going like, Oh, she's got excuses why she can't do. It. And again, I know the real reasons why, but I, you uh-huh. know, you hear that over the years of people just kind of like, Oh, you're just on social security. Cause of this. it's like, do you understand how hard it is? Like I, there are people who uh-huh. can work, but they, they, they're so frustrated with the market and, and, and how many bad experiences they've had. They're just gun shy of ever wanting to get back out there. Obviously this isn't right. your case, but you know, it, it, there's the system is so screwed and you know, it, it there's a lot of people who can't do uh, certain mm-hmm. things. And, and, and like I said, it, it's not set up for us to succeed. And that's why when people do and people make something, it, it's an ama- it's more than an amazing story than what you think it is. Because, you know, with us, a lot of our success stories, some of our uh, congratulatory type of things that we over we overcome and accomplish like accomplishing having your own place or working or you know mm-hmm. those are real accomplishments just because the average person has a job doesn't mean right. they, they got it because of whatever they knew somebody or whatever but we have to fight for everything and that's yeah what people don't know yeah. like that's why i like to focus on mm-hmm. a lot of the harsh parts of it even though i don't want to just talk about the bad yeah. stuff but i want people to no. realize like it's not it, it's so much harder to be disabled when it, outside of the disability itself, there's so many more yes. things that keep our lives harder. And it, Oh it, man, yeah. if it was just a disability, I mean, the disability is hard enough in itself yeah. and what people, you know, I don't know that if I got to yet is the brain fog that goes around, um, um, Meniere's disease and Meniere's disease also comes with, you know, the depression, I have depression, anxiety, all of these things that it also comes with. Um, and it's, it's a struggle, you know, I, I mean, I honestly, I mean, the fights that it has caused just between me and my husband, because he doesn't understand and he's trying to understand, but, um, he can't, he can't understand. And then, you know, as it's, it's been a year and so he's come home when I've been on the ground and in my own throw up and, you know, all of these things and he's starting to understand right. and still has a hard time. And so you really like, I, my mom's disabled, my, my son disability, my son is now, he's going to turn 30 this year and we fought for seven, almost seven years for him to get disability because he has epilepsy and it is not controlled by his medication. And, um, 
you know, even when he was going through the whole disability thing, they hired somebody to come say, hey, you know, what jobs can, what jobs would hire this man, right? That's part of the disability process. Yeah. And um, it's a third party and she came on and she, you know, went through the whole thing and said, you know, there is nobody that will hire Zachary because nobody is going to hire somebody that can at any second drop to the ground and have a massive grand mal seizure. Mm-hmm. Um, nobody's going to do that. And they still denied him and they denied him and they denied him. And the problem with his uh, epilepsy is it wasn't diagnosed before 18. If it was, he would have been taken care of the whole rest of his life. Yeah. Um, but they didn't diagnose it. They, I'm actually the one that figured out what it was. Um, and so, I mean, seven years of a fight. And if it wasn't for me and his dad, he wouldn't, he would have been living on the street, you know? Yeah. And, and people, he kept getting denied and denied. Well, my son has long hair, you know, a beard, kind of a hippie looking guy. And, and, you know, he kept getting denied this disability. And the funny thing is, is um, he just got approved uh, in this last year. And it was an over-the-phone uh, um, proceeding where he talked to the judge over the phone and, and they didn't see him in person. And he got approved for his disability. Mm-hmm. And it took seven years. And there are people that we know of that were on disability for, for things that, you know, it, it's yourself into a chair, whatever, um, things that were way less, you know, but and people it, were much just easier to get it for fit. Like, like for me with, yeah. my, I can do for physical disabilities. That's way easier because a lot of people think, again, there are a lot of people faking shit and, and, and all that. And, right. You know, but it, of course, you got the whole like, oh, I'll sue you, and then they fall, they fake fall on the floor, and they're wearing a neck brace type of crap. Yeah, but like the, there are Whatever, like the, yeah. the chronic invisible disabilities, the chronic illnesses. Like those are much harder for them to to re, I don't mm-hmm. to recognize, um, mm-hmm. even though they're just as bad as any other condition. It's just physical disability. You come yeah. in a wheelchair. It's like okay, give it give yeah. it whatever he wants. Uh, and again, I'm right. not, I'm not saying they don't deserve that, but you know, it's, it's just one of those, yeah, it, there's, there's a real hierarchy of what you, cause even I yeah. know with, with having a visually impairment, what I'm allowed to work, even though, you know, like my hours aren't really restricted. It's just the amount I can make. But when I look at some, like some of the learning disabilities and some of them, they're way worse. Like visually impairment yeah. actually gets some of the better benefits as far as working. Uh, I don't understand why it's any different but it's, it's their way right. of what they perceive us, what we can do and what we should be able to do. And again, that's where it goes back to being the, the trap and, you know, the frustration of having a disability, because sometimes mm-hmm. there's things where, you know, I'm, I'm a fighter. I've fought my whole life, but there's times where mm-hmm. I just want something to go, not even just my way, just to go simply. Like you put the toast in yeah. the toaster, it, brown, it, it makes it. it brown and toasty and it pops up and, you know, <laughs> but it's like, it always seems like, you know, the toast will get jammed or the toast will shoot out uh-huh. and go on the floor. And now you got to do it because it, mm-hmm. redo it because it's dirty type of, you know, analogy mm-hmm. because, yeah. you know, like oh, your yeah. son, like you should just, it's obvious he should just get disability. It's, it's clear as day that this person has a problem and he should uh-huh. have disability. And it's like, no, you have to wait seven years. You got to fight and fight and fight and you got to uh-huh. be stressed out and depressed and just, you know, you, yeah. Yeah. and then, and give half of your money to the lawyer at that point. Right. Um, yeah, right. and which you do gladly cause you wouldn't get it if you didn't have him, but still, and, and, um, the thing that people don't see in that situation is my son who feels like garbage because he's, you know, 20 some years old now, almost 30. He feels much better now, right. but Good. that he has to ask mom for underwear and socks that he cannot buy a gift for anybody. He hated himself because, I mean, imagine that. Like, me and you might be able to imagine that, but 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 a normal person might not be able to imagine that going through life and never being able to give a gift. Yeah, psychologically, like, you're an adult, and, and you know, there are people who yeah. have, like, the mindset and intelligence of – you know, younger people because but that's their condition. But when you're actually an adult and you, you, you know, you know better and 
you right. want to work and you're inspired and you, you want, want you, to you want to do mm-hmm. stuff and they're telling you no. And so you have to say, well, I got to live with my mom because I can't, you know, I got to live with my parents for the rest of my life or most right. of my life until I find somebody who will accept me. And, you know, and again, I, you know, even yeah. the dating world is another problem, but it, it, it's, yeah, you know, there's so mm-hmm. many hurdles and that, mm-hmm. like I said, it's the, the disability. And again, there are people who really do get breaks and get lucky and, and, you yeah, know, and there are, but yeah. But the majority, like I didn't, I used to, I used to feel compassion for my son. You know, he has to stay at home all the time. He's a computer geek. Of course he is. He's got to have something to do. Right. Um, and he, he, we're talking about a kid who in, in, in second grade, um, um, tested post high school in his spatial math skills. Um, like, college grade in second grade like he was so so gifted and still is gifted but he does not score that anymore on his iq test because he's had so many seizures he's broke his back in six places you know i mean his shoulders are gone because of his seizures because he does these huge things with his arms when he has his seizures and um he's ripped the cuff out so many times and had surgery i mean people just don't understand and when they see my son they see a healthy dude and they don't understand that you know um when we go to the hardware store he can't pick up that huge piece of wood you know they just think he's being lazy you know and like me are you kidding me that i'm being lazy i I worked since i was 14 the one thing that drove me and that drives me every day like drove me to feeling so terrible and checking myself in is I felt worthless. I want to work. I don't know what to do with myself without working. You know, um, my kids, my family, um, they give me crap because when I have my attacks that I now say my small attacks, um, because somehow I've found in the, in the smaller attacks a way to find, and I don't know if anybody, you know, if this is going to sound crazy or what, but a small space in my head that I can control and, and stabilize enough to get up and make myself some toast or do simple things like that. I've worked and struggled with it, with this, this dizziness. Yeah. And so I found, you know, a way through it to a certain point of dizziness, you know, yeah. And, um, so my, my family makes fun of me cause I'll take my, I'll have a really bad dizzy spell. I'll take a pill and it will lighten just enough to that point where I can get up and, and, and work through it, you know, yeah. and they'll see me struggle and something like cleaning my house that would have taken me, uh, you know, two hours to do the main part of my house takes me the entire day now. Right. I think it's, I think um, it's great though that at least, you know, even though, you know, your son, your daughter, you like there's struggles, but at least you guys have each other. And, you know, yeah. there, there's a, you know, you have your own little home community where you just, you know, you all struggling, but you can kind of help take care of each other. Um, you know, I mean, of course it doesn't all, I'm sure it doesn't always line up where someone's hurt and I'm sure sometimes two people are down and, but yeah, you know, um, but you can look the, out for each other. Well, my oldest son lives with his dad. Um, so it's just him and his dad, and now they have their, um, he has a, a half brother that now lives with him. He's 14. So they kind of help with Zachary there. And, um, if his, if he starts having a lot of seizures and they get bad, he usually comes here for me to take care of him. Mm-hmm. But, um, and my daughter now lives on her own. Um, she's 24. Um, she lived with me until about six months ago because uh, I've told you last year we went through cancer with her kidney cancer and had to have half of her kidney removed and all that stuff. So she was struggling. So she was at home for a while, <laughs> but now she's at in her own place. And so I, now it's just me, my husband and my youngest son here at home. Okay. Yeah. And my youngest son works nights. So <laughs> he sleep all day and, and working at night. Right, one of those, yeah. Um, and then my husband works in the daytime. So for me, my actually my biggest um, 
figures, which is kind of funny because I went a long period where I was like not wanting to have animals because my kids kind of had every animal and it ruined it for me for a while. Um, Hmm. But my savior has actually been um, my rabbit. (laughs) Um, Because when you're home alone all the time with disability, especially like any disability and a disability where you can have attacks, um, be surprised. Um, I'm sure you can relate with your cat. Uh, Having my rabbit, um, made a huge difference in having, I mean, I talk to my rabbit when I'm home alone. My son laughs at me when he's sleeping because he can hear me sometimes. Hmm. Like he's, another person is home with me. <laughs> yeah. Um, they give me companionship and, and I don't feel quite as alone, alone, you know? Yeah. And I remember, especially with my, I mean, my, the cat I have now, I've had him for a year. It's still roughly new, but my other cat I have for 15 years when, I was really in some yeah. of my deepest, darkest days and when I was bawling my eyes out mm-hmm. over God knows what, you know, right. she was always there and just like her rubbing uh-huh. up against me and just being there. And it was, it was, it was, it's why I said, you know, I don't think I'll ever love another thing or person more than that cat because of what she, right. got, what she got me through because I wanted to die for so long. Uh-huh. And when she was there, yep. just, I felt, even though I still felt alone to some degree, I, at least I felt something carried right. me. Yeah, something loved you through all of it, through your disability, through everything. Right. Somebody was there to love you no matter what. And that, like, I never really, I guess I never had that. You always have that need, but I guess it was never this bad, like, um, to where you feel so lonely and, and people, even, even people who are closest to you are not understanding you and what you're going through. And there's this rabbit or this cat that's just looking at you like the same and loves you to death and, um, hugs you and doesn't care if you're crying or, you know, and when you're sick, it wants to be next to you because of the heat. And yes. you know, yeah, you don't, um, you don't like, even yeah. if you, even when you're at your worst times or you feel the ugliest you could be, you know, maybe snot dripping yeah. on your nose and there's, and there's no makeup in your case or, yeah. you know, you're half dressed right. and you just look like complete shit, at least in your mind. Even if you look, even if you're gorgeous, you just look like complete right. shit in your mind and you feel the worst and you don't want anyone right. to see you, but the animal, it's like, who cares? The animal doesn't care. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. yeah that's they don't of, judge you. Yeah. Yeah. No. That's why you know I understand why people get these like emotional support animals because they they really do something for you. Um, yeah, and that's when my daughter. So my daughter got her rabbit when she lived here, and she had cancer, and um, she actually struggled on on how to feel because she was able to get surgery and it was removed and she didn't have to go through chemo and it looks like they got everything and she just needs to be checked, you know, every six months for a while and all these things. So um, people were making her feel like her cancer was less because she'd go through chemo and all this stuff. Right. And they're missing the fact that she's 23 years old and had kidney cancer face death basically you know, at 23 years old at the time when she was diagnosed and went through having half of her kidney taken off and this surgery and, and everything. And she's like, mom, I thought it was her way of just getting, you know, a, an animal. Cause she was the one that always had to bring home every animal in the world. Um, when she was young and I, she said, I'm going to get this emotional support rabbit um, so that we can have it in the duplex and the landlord, you know, I figured it was just a way for her to get this rabbit, you know, a loophole. Cause I was like, yeah, right. An emotional support rabbit, right? right. What is that rabbit going to do for you? And then it ends up being funny where she goes back to work and I end up having this disability, like, like being struck by this vertigo and being a homesick. And here's this rabbit. <laughs> yeah. And I bonded with him so much and he helped me so much um that when she moved out i ended up getting my own rabbit because i couldn't be without it and and um yeah yeah, yeah. so well when they i are, see the legitimateness of an emotional support bunny an emotional support animal made all the difference in the world for me yeah and now i understand you know wow the importance of it and the impact it can have 
Yeah. No, I mean, like, one of the things you were saying that made me, because, like, when we first started talking, I was telling you I was kind of, like, in my own depressional ways, and um, and it's just, because it's off and on, you know, like, it, it sometimes it's hard to get strength. It's hard to feel inspired mm -hmm. when, and you know, how many times people, I was just out with a friend, and, and she was like, what are you going to do for the rest of the day? And I'm like, well, I got a podcast interview, and then after that, I'm not doing anything. Because then, and that's usually what people are like, well, what's what's going on with your life? And I don't really have anything to say. I mean, obviously, I do a lot of great work with the podcast, but I'm trying to like, especially with like tra lack of transportation, like that, that especially right. as a visually impaired and blind person or a person with a disability, mm -hmm. transportation is always one of the biggest problems. Yep. And I'm trying to like be more inspired and try to do more things. And so when you're home, like like you are and me and, and a lot of others, we're, we're constantly stuck with our thoughts. And, and a lot of times it wanders off mm -hmm. to the worst of places and and you know, and and you're mm -hmm. stuck there. And obviously the animals help and all that, but there's so many times where it's hard to just get yourself out of bed. Forget the, forget the disability itself, especially in your case, because like, mm -hmm. my eyes don't really keep me from getting out of bed. Uh, even when I have bad eye days, but when I have bad eye days, it's the mental part that says, why bother get out of bed? Um, right. It's, it's, yeah. You, yeah, you're just, you're mentally crippled and you're stuck and you, you're trying mm -hmm. to find inspiration. And, you know, like before you said, are you ready? Like, I'm just laying on the couch with my cat and, I'm just trying to like care because like there's even times when I know I'm doing good things with this. It's like there's a part of me was just mm -hmm. like, why Why do I want to do this po podcast interview today? You don't even feel like, you know, yourself. Mm -hmm. You feel just sad and angry. You're not even angry, but just yeah. sad. And it's just I know, you know, again, I, I get myself out of it. But yeah, it, it's it's really hard when you just feel the, the, the quicksand where you're just getting pulled in and pulled in. And you're just like, man, like I know my mm -hmm. life is changing. I know I'm doing a lot of good, but I also it's again, back to what I said to you off air about, you know, it's the patience. Like I have to be patient, but I've been stuck so long. I've been in a hospital mm -hmm. bed and I've been dying and I've dealt with just right. depression and I've had to lay in bed for so many hours and so many days that it's like, I want to move. I want to do shit. Yeah. I want to change things. And, and mm -hmm. it's hard when, you know, so yeah, when you've been stuck, for so long it it's hard people one of the things people don't understand is the physical part okay so the physical part of my disability is brutal right yeah. but um i have i have a um routine that i do you know um mornings are hard for me i have a special bed that i sit up slowly like just certain things that i've done in a routine to kind of get around some of the physical part because when you have um, a disability that keeps you at home and um, that keeps you sometimes in bed, sometimes on the couch, whatever, um, your body feels terrible from sitting around. Your back hurts, your foot hurts, everything hurts. It's achy. And then, you know, you're depressed. And on so on top of the achiness of your body um, and your disability, you're depressed and you have anxiety because you never know when you're going to have a bad eye day, when you're going to have an attack, when your next dizzy thing is going to come. And you're also stressed. I'm also, you know, I stress out about um, so many things. How am I going to pay my bills? How am I going to, um, you know, get my soap business to a place where I'm making a profit? How am I going to do all of these things? Um, yeah, it's very overwhelming. Yeah, and to trying to talk yourself out of getting out of bed. Like, so it's hard. And let alone, like, I love, love, love making soap. Like, my favorite thing to do. It is the only thing that I've ever found that I'm, I, to put my creativeness and all that in, right? So I love to do it. I can get lost in it for 12 hours. But when I get out of bed and, and my veneers is acting up or, you know, my body is achy from having to be in bed from not feeling good and I'm depressed and I'm feeling like, oh, it's not going to matter. My business isn't going to go anywhere anyways. You know, all of these things. And I don't want to go in there and make soap. The thing that makes me like most happy. Yeah. I mean, that, that's a problem. It's not, you know, oh, I don't want to get up and sweep the floor today. It's I don't want to get up and do something like a podcast or like making soap that brings me joy, you know. Depression and 
having a, dis- a physical disability together, especially, I mean, each on its own is a struggle, but when you have them both, they just feed off of one another. Yeah. Yeah. And it's one of those where you should reach out for help and all, but it's, you know, even back to what you were saying about the, you know, with your condition, it's, it's a stigma thing. And so when you start telling people, oh yeah, I'm sad or mental health, people hear what people know about mental health and it's like, oh, straight jackets, uh-huh. medication, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, yeah, dude, like, yes, I'm, I'm depressed. Yeah. I'm struggling, but I'm still living. I'm still paying my bills. I'm not, you know, I'm not, right. you know, I'm not bulimic or what I'm not cutting myself. And again, that shit happens right. too. But at the end of the day, I'm still being strong. It's just, I'm struggling right now because I'm sad. I'm lonely. And, um, mm-hmm. you know, and, and it's like, for me, one of the things that gets me up every day is like, you know, like obviously people like you and obviously like your son. Cause like, I, I think I said to do this the other day. I was just like, I don't want people to have to go through the shit we're going through. Like just, just right. you know, with the lack of knowledge of all these conditions and the the job market mm-hmm. and schooling and and just dating mm-hmm. and all this shit, it's it's so hard. And yeah, it people is. people do make it. And you know, you you know, my mom used to always when I was like not inspired, she always said, "Well, there's blind lawyers." And, there's, and I'm like, "Yeah, but that doesn't mean everybody <laughs> can be that. That doesn't mean like he caught breaks right. too." And there's a lot of shit. And again, good for him, and he's, that- he's inspiring. But that, yeah. that doesn't always work out for us and and no and sometimes that's very hurtful that goes back to something i was going to say to you but i get sidetracked very easily um within my mental fog and stuff um is um gosh darn it what did you just say (laughs) about the blind guy being a lawyer and and yes so my husband works at his at his work right um he he went in to ask for a raise because he deserves it. He's a supervisor. They're hiring people brand new, $3 an hour less than him, like off the street, don't know anything. Right. right. And so he goes in, you know, to ask for this raise. It's $2. He's like, I need to be making, you know, this much money. Um, you know, my wife can't work. And, you know, I just, I basically, I deserve this money. And it turned into a, like, I would love to give you what you're asking, but I can't give it to you just because your wife has, at home and can't work. Right. Mm-hmm. And then, and then they gave him a list of things that they think I might be able to do from home. Right. And on top of that, there's a young lady there that works there that says I have Meniere's. Well, she, you know, had a couple of tasks, she was diagnosed with Meniere's, um, got on some medication, stopped having attacks, has never had an attack again, eats all the salt she wants in the day. And, um, it's fine. So what's your wife's problem? Right. Yeah. I mean, I know someone who has lupus and, and they take, they do all kind of like herbal stuff and it like, she barely has any pain. And I know someone who has lupus right. and is in chronic, you know, in bed yeah. because of all the pain she has to go through. So exactly. It's, it's different. It's like fibromyalgia. Everybody. You know, there's people with fibromyalgia, um, which is something that I'm going through testing, you know, for right now, or we're just trying to find a neurologist. Uh, mm-hmm people with fibromyalgia that work and and live lives, you know, that are still able to hold jobs and stuff. And then there's people with fibromyalgia that can't get out of bed. Yeah. There's people with disabilities who can function and do everything and, but they're just a little off. And then there's people who literally are rocking back and forth and they need someone to take care of them. There's, there's a huge difference. And so we Mm -hmm. already compare ourselves to people who are able bodies and, you know, we always right. compare, especially even if with women, like women are always in, in, in competition with each other of looks and all that nonsense. So even as a kid, you start doing stuff like that. But yeah. then when people, like, like I said, my mom would do it, I don't think she realized how much it would bother me because it was like, well, you know, of course, then there's also starving kids in Africa and there's blind kids, right. blind people. And it's like, yeah, I get all that. And I get it. Now I really seem like a failure and now I suck. But they're not my story and I got to just, I got to find a way my, my own way. And again, we all go down a different path and I have no interest to be in a damn lawyer anyway. Um, right. Yeah. yeah. We all have our own path and we all have our own struggles and gifts and it's, um, you can't be, you can't be compared to somebody else. Your disability, it's just like when your disease in itself is experienced in so many different ways. And when I go to the doctor, it's so funny. Is um, my one of my doctors here locally? I ended up getting sent away to Phoenix um, because I live in a smaller town here. 
Um, and, and the Ian, ear, nose and throat I was going through was like, you're just, I, I don't know what to do with you. So he sent me away, but, um, he, um, gosh, darn it. See, I forgot what I was saying again. It's okay. You're good. <laughs> but anyways, um, yeah. Yeah, no, I completely no, you're, you're that thing. yeah. I mean, it's, <laughs> no, I mean, I, I have, I've been, I've been taking these like supplements, and it helps for brain fog, and it's, it's working. I don't know. Um, yeah, I am. Um, that's one thing I've been looking into supplements. Um, we try. We went to the local store here, but they didn't have them, so we were looking at ordering them. But there's so many like different kinds, and how do you know if you're getting the right thing and I'll show you the one that I take. I, I like it so far. It's called Qualia of Life. Okay. It's Q or sorry, Qualia Mind. Qualia Mind. It's Q U A L I A, uh, and you gotta take like seven of seven of them in the morning before you eat for five days straight, and then two days you don't take it, and then you go back five days again. So for me, it's Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, then Monday, Tuesday off, and then Wednesday, you know, blah blah blah. And it, there's a lot of great ingredients, all healthy stuff, and and. I have noticed a little more energy. I've noticed a little more like I can, cause I, I kind of do tests where I, I like, will try to bring up like an old show that I used to watch and I'll try to remember all the cast members names or, uh, Holy shit like yeah. that. And I, I started to I, notice I was doing it the other day and I was like, even when I was struggling to find a couple of their names, one, I, I got like the one I was doing, like I got like all of them except for like one, but I was in the ballpark of the name. And whereas right. like, when I have brain fog without it, I'm trying to access a name. I'm trying to access a word or a show or something. And every time I try to go into like the uh, wheel of letters and, and just like, okay, let's yeah. start with, okay, I know it's C O something, C O T, C O. And I start, I can't even do that because I'm like bouncing off this like force field that won't allow me to even access my brain. And that's when I knew right. the fog was so much worse mm -hmm. than. You know, cause people are like, well, you know, everybody has trouble forgetting, remembering things. No. And I'm like, no, I know no. I'm pretty quick on my feet and I couldn't, mm -hmm. there's just a certain feeling in my mind. And I went to doctors mm -hmm. and they're saying, well, everything looks good and all that. And I'm like, yeah, I don't care what you tell me. I know something is off. And so this one uh, supplement I've been yeah. taking and it, it, it's pretty well known. It's pretty, it's, it's considered like the top of the line mm -hmm. supplement. And I've been taking it for about two, a little over a week. And I'm seeing some okay. real effects. I like it. Um, it doesn't mean it'll work for you. Um, but right. I, I, you know, I like it so far. And when I told my doctor that I was taking it, she knew what it was. And she said, that's, that's a pretty good thing to take. So, um, nice. Nice. yeah, but yeah. I, yeah. Well, I'd be interested in looking into that. Okay. Um, yeah. I, so I, um, you know, I have been going to, because in the midst of, of all of this and, you know, getting diagnosed with all these things I was diagnosed with ADHD on top of everything else, which did not surprise me because my boys both have ADHD and my dad. And, mm -hmm. um, but, um, I went, so I, I'm going through my access to my site, my um, counselor and then, um, a psychiatrist. And I have a case manager and the case manager suggested it's in the same building, you know, of, of the psychiatrist and everything that I go to. Hey, um, I think you would benefit from this program that they have and it's cognitive training. And um, you test and, you know, you take the test and they tell you where you stand and if you need some cognitive training and if you had talked to me a few months ago, you would have heard me say, um, I don't remember where I was going, like every other, you know, sentence that I was trying to say. Mm -hmm. um, and with you, it's just the, but like, there's so much to this disability and, and so much that I'm trying to talk about so much that I just kind of get lost in it. Oh, gotcha. um, but it was happening constantly. And I tested you know, I took this test because she said, you know, you can get some cognitive training. It really helps people um, with their brains reawaken parts um, that have fallen asleep, you know, and, and can help with relationships and stuff. So obviously I did it. I'm trying to do everything I can um, to get better. And there's no cure for Meniere's, but, but to get better better mentally and, and just keep continue to fight. It's a constant fight, you know. 
that and just and, uh, a healthier life. And there's just, there's certain yeah. ways you can, you, you could better yourself to where. Better my quality of life with the problems that I'm having. Yeah. And you basically. just never know what could happen out of it. Like you just don't. There's a lot right. of people that do certain crazy shit, even if like, you know, that's why a lot of people swear by, you know, marijuana where it helps with right. a lot of chronic pain. Like you just don't know what can help you. And you right. know, one day, maybe, you know, your Meniere's gets a little better just because you ate more lettuce. I don't fucking know, but it, right. you just don't know. Well, and my Meniere's is also triggered by stress. It's one of my number one triggers. Right. So um, it's very stressful to be in the middle of talking and then forget what you're saying. When you have lived a life where, I mean, you know, I'm an intelligent person, always been quick on my feet. First one to, you know, think of something. And all of a sudden, I'm living like, underwater I don't even know how to explain it it's like the whole part of my brain I can't access and I'm feeling like crazy something's really wrong with me you know and so she, so my case manager's like you know you, you should try this out it's okay you know let me do this so I take the test and I I tested uh, to be autistic on their test right and it's not the test like they have more tests for autism further tests but I tested to be on the spectrum and they were they said you know um you're testing very high in, in math, math and stuff that problem solving with things right in front of you, but very low in other areas. And it's very um, odd to be when you usually test, you test in the same area. You might be lower in some areas, but not extremely like the highest you can score in some areas and, and really low in others, you know? Mm-hmm. And so they said I would need 36 weeks of cognitive training. And usually it's a 12 week program. Um, so I've been going to cognitive training twice a week for an hour each session. So two times a week, um, I drive to go to cognitive training, um, because of these problems that I've been struggling with. Um, I don't know if it was the depression and the Meniere's at the same time. Um, and, and the fact that I went from being social every single day of my life to being stuck at home and not talking to anybody. Right. Um, you know, there's just so much, but I, I am going to cognitive training twice a week because of, of everything that has been going on and it's, uh, how it's affecting my brain and all these things. Yeah. Um, so it's more than just, Oh, you know, I have many years that causes vertigo. People don't understand that something can cause so many other things, you know? Yeah. No, but you know, like, you know, cause you're, you're again, you're still getting acclimated to this whole situation and, but you now are starting to come out of your shell, obviously doing this and, and, and it'll be, I'm sure other things down the road, but when you do that, like you're, what you're doing helps you know, obviously your kids because you know, you want them mm-hmm. to grow up comfortable with who they are you want them to love themselves Mm -hmm. because again people with disabilities are still not on that radar of well you should love yourself for being disabled you you hear body shaming and you hear all these words that Mm -hmm. are kind of silly but the sentiment is good and Mm -hmm. you don't really hear a whole lot for people with disabilities because people don't really understand us and there's so many variations of a disability and and you know, and then there's a lot of people that, you know, just screw it up for us and shit like that. But when you speak up, like you, you, you know, it's, it's, you know, for me, like I said, when I think of like with your son, like, you know, I'm trying to do some of my part to make this a better world for someone like your son, mm-hmm. because even though, yeah, he may be maybe right. three years younger than me. It's like, I don't want people to go through, you know, what we go through and, and I want, you know, yeah. I want to speak up and I'll put myself out there in the fire just because I, again, I don't want, I don't want anyone like your son to go through that shit. It's, it's depressing. It's yeah. horrible. And you know, we need people like you that are just strong and yeah, it sucks. It doesn't mean your life isn't great. It doesn't mean you don't cry. It doesn't mean you're not stressed or angry, yeah. but we still yeah. have to be strong because we are strong. It's just, it's hard to always be strong. It really is. It takes a it, lot it out of is. us. Yeah, and you know what? What one of the things that I've learned um, in a lot of the books that I've been listening to and stuff lately is we as people in America were like, um, and even me, my whole life, I've always been that one person in the family that everything happens to. You know, they always have that one person. That's me. You know, me or my kids or whatever. It's always been that one person, and um. I've had, I was 23 years old when I had, I, I think I told you my son died of SIDS, right? Right, yeah. And um, 
I've always been told I'm so strong, right? And I've always told people, well, you know, I've just always been so strong. Well, you know, I've just always been so strong. And we take pride in that. And really sometimes being so strong is just, it's not really something to be proud of or something to be, that's great. It's, it's really shoving a lot of things down. For me, it was not dealing with a lot of things. It was not having any importance on myself, always making sure that I was taking care of other people, never putting myself first ever, you know, just um, yeah. being strong was me getting through life. It was coping, you know, it was a coping technique. And it is a good thing. It is a positive thing that to be strong, but also sometimes it's even stronger to stand up like I'm doing, like you're doing, like other people are doing and saying, Hey, look, this, I have this disability and it sucks and it's ugly, you know? And, um, I have to be strong every single day just to get out of bed and do this podcast or whatever. I go through every single day to do something that, uh, that I used to take for granted every day of my life, you know? Right. You're right. You're right. I mean, Um, the biggest war that you go through on a daily basis is with your own damn mind. Every day, no matter how mm -hmm. much you accomplish, no matter how much you do, you just always try to find some way to sabotage yourself. And, Mm -hmm. you know, and and that's why I try to explain to some people who don't really know. I mean, everybody has mental health, but they don't like my grandma. She, she grew up in a time where it's like, you know, you don't do medication. You just, you just suck it up. You know, she grew up poor. So she had, she had a porta potty. Like she had to go outside to go to the bathroom. She grew up in a small home. And so she grew up in like the great depression era. And so she just, she doesn't Mm -hmm. like understand all this because so much, you know, knowledge and and medical technology and everything has changed how we think and what we do now. So And I try to tell her, it's like, look, grandma, like I, there's days I just don't want to do the dishes. I don't want to do it. Like, and I, I'm trying not, I'm not, when you see me at work at my other job, like I'm a very good worker. I put, a, I put time and effort in. I really, t- I really care. And it's not that I don't mm-hmm. care about my life. It's not that I don't care. Again, I put a lot of time and effort to the podcast, but I just like, there's times I just want to lay on the couch with my cat and I don't want to do nothing. And it's sad. And again, if I had more people that like were less disabled and they wanted to do more and I had a, a decent girlfriend or whatever. Yeah. Maybe I would right. be more likely to go out and, but the wars I have within my head uh, uh-huh. so many times where it's like, yeah, I, I don't, I, I can't always be the best me. I can't always be mm-hmm. sh- strong. I can't always, I, sometimes I just have to just give in and just lay there because I'm tired mm-hmm. and I'm, I'm mentally, that's one of the things with, with the supplement I was telling you about is it's given me a little more energy and a little more motivation. Anything will help because right. I have times where I'm just like, I'm like, I got two days off coming up. I'm going to get this done, this done, this done. The two days go by. I did like one of those things. And I'm like, you start to feel useless. Mm-hmm. It's like, what is wrong with me? Why can't I like set out a goal and accomplish it, accomplish it. And then, and then I forget about all the goals I actually did accomplish within the last year or so. And so again, like I yeah. said, it's a psychological yeah. warfare that you go through with your own self. And, and, yeah. that, and that's, like I said, that's the deep, darkest parts that we don't a lot of times don't like to conversate about because people want to think that everyone's nice and and everyone's perfect and everyone's Mm -hmm. good and all that and it's like no dude like we all had this shit it's just the magnitude and the the strength of of how much of it that you have right yeah like so many things people are like oh depression oh well i get sad and and if depression is being sad it's not it's the magnitude of it like even me with depression struggling throughout my life on and off, right? I, I, I've struggled with depression, but I think I told you this was last time. Like I checked myself in because I no longer wanted to be here. It was a depression that was above well, anything else. And then people don't understand the, the, the pull that something can have on you and, and, and they don't want to understand it. So anything that people don't understand or that scare, scares them, you know, and, um, people want to hear, yeah, you always want to, people are always, like you said about makeup, like trying to be prettier than the girl next year or whatever. That is when you deal with being disabled, that is like, 
for me, something I don't even think about anymore. It's like ridiculous. I just want to be able to wake up and brush my hair and braid it, (laughs) you know, like, and when I think one of the things that helped me the most in understanding, like what you're saying, uh, you do, you know, you do the podcast and then you'll have a day off where you want to just lay in bed and stuff is, I don't know if you've read the spoon theory. I'm, I'm, it's very popular. I'm sure you've heard of it. Um, my, I, I, I read the spoon theory and I was like, Oh my gosh, because with Meniere's disease, um, the exhaustion that comes along, you know, the depression, all these things, um, I can't do as much as I used to do. And when I feel good, I get up and I push myself, you know, so much that I'll end up having an attack the next day and not feeling good. And it's because I now, I used to have unlimited spoons. Okay. But now I have like eight and I can use 16 spoons today, but if I do, that means tomorrow I'm not going to be able to do anything. So I can't do as much as a normal, a regular person can do. I can't do as much as I used to, but I can do this much. And it's getting used to being only able to do that much, you know, where somebody else might say, oh my gosh, my husband might look at me and say, you know, see me stumbling through the house with one of my eyes closed because that's what I do a lot to um, cut down on the amount of stuff I'm intaking into my brain um, and say, Tara, you frosted all those soaps today and you could barely walk. You were stumbling. That's a great accomplishment. And why I look at it as all I did was frost, you know, these 20 soaps today. I have all these other things I need to do. That's all I got done today. Right. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. You know? that, yeah. Like one of the, one of my like current struggles is like I'm on a bowling team. And so <clears throat> being legally blind, I can't see those lines out there and I can see the pins right. they're blurry, but I could see them and you know, I'll get some strikes. I'll get some spares. I'll get some shots, but like, you know, my score average is somewhere between like a hundred and 120, which is decent, but it's like every time I do bad, I take it out of myself because I don't know if it's because my Uh mind isn't focused. I don't know if it's because my eyes suck and (laughs) I want to be good so bad because I'm on a team and and there's another person on the team, my friend, Julia, she's got a vision problem as well. And she goes through similar thoughts, but it's, it's, I don't want to let my team down and I want to be good so bad because I don't want my vision Mm -hmm. to get in the way because it has gotten the way of a lot Mm -hmm. of things. And I want to be, and so that's the mental, that's like just as a, as an example of like what you said with your soap, because it's like, I I Mm -hmm. look at the bowling and I, I have to come calm down sometimes and realize like, look, dude, you're, you're fucking, most people wouldn't even attempt to do what you're doing with the eyesight you have, but you know, you're trying, you're, you're, you're getting better little by little and you're having some success. And, you know, maybe you'll never throw a 300. Maybe you'll never even hit 200. But it's like you're, you're getting, you're hitting pins and you're legally blind. And, yeah, it doesn't mean you right. can't see. But it, it just means that you, you, you're still and you're out there trying. And I got Sometimes I got to just calm my ass down because I get so frustrated with myself. And I take it out of myself because I'm like, God, like, what is it? Is it yeah. my eyes or is it just because I can't focus? Something about me is broken and I can't fucking fix my right. bowling score. And, and, and Right. And no, I so get what you're saying because to me, okay. And and I wish it's like, if we could just be as kind to ourselves as we were to other people, because I look at, I I hear you say, you know, my bowling team. And I kind of almost, I kind of chuckled a little bit because I'm laughing because, okay, so you're beating yourself up at this, you know, 120 score, which I get when I go bowling and I have complete vision. I mean, I wear glasses, but I have good vision. Um, so the thought of you beating yourself up for getting this 100 and 120 score being legally blind makes me laugh because most people, I mean, I've never heard, I don't know of anybody else or heard of anybody who's struggled with being legally blind and even thought of the fact that they might ever even go bowling. <laughs> right. No, so no, the things that we beat ourselves up on about is just insane. I hear you saying I'm on a bowling team and I'm legally blind. And I think, holy moly, just the fact that you are going there and putting yourself in that situation to be that vulnerable and try to hit pins at the end of a long thing that most people can't hit. 
is inspiring to me. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I've, I've, I've gotten better with putting myself out there. I'm because I, I don't want to be embarrassed about that I, i'm trying to mm-hmm. own who i am i can't be a disability advocate and hate myself for having a disability it doesn't it just doesn't work and yeah and I, I really do appreciate my journey again back to what we were talking about how it's everything else that makes the disability harder i've come to terms with mm-hmm. my eyes sucking i've come to terms with making mm-hmm. everything in my life work for me um and, and right. you know zooming in and, and focusing magnifiers mm-hmm. and whatever else i've i've i have my life to where i need it to be for my eyes right. to work, it's just, you know, I know if I lose my job tomorrow, I mean, again, I'm working on building this podcast as a brand and, and getting advertisers and all right. that, but that's not where it's at right now. It's still new in its infancy. Right. So yeah. I need, if I, if I, you know, I, as I said with the job I'm at, like I can't burn a bridge until I have another one made. And if I quit my yeah. job tomorrow, it's not easy for me to find another one. And it, right. it's, you know, just going on dating sites and trying to find a decent girl and just feeling lonely and all that bullshit. And, right. and it's everything else that makes it harder. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, and mm-hmm. so when I do step out into the world and I do something like bowling, I am happy, but I'm trying, my mind always wants to try to ruin it for me, no matter how happy I am, but oh, yeah. I'm getting better, mm-hmm. a lot better with it. It's just, God, like, you know, it's, it sucks when you just know that you have something that draws attention to you. And I fucking hate that Mm -hmm. because I don't care about what people have. I mean, there's a team there that, uh, there's a company that has like a special needs team and there's like four of them. They're fucking great. We, we Mm -hmm. hug each other. They're high five. They're really into it. And it's like, I don't give a shit what, one of them gay. I don't care. We have fun. And, but there's some of them are just so serious and they take everything. And it's like, and I'm, I'm trying to just, be somewhere in the middle of just balance and have fun because life is too damn short. And, but then, mm-hmm. you, you know, of course, as a man, the competitiveness gets in you and you're just like, it's like, Ugh. yeah. So it, it, it's a war, but yeah, I mean, as a person with a disability, you have to try, you have to come out your comfort zone because you'll never succeed in, in your comfort zone because your comfort zone is just going to keep yeah. you from doing anything. It's going to keep you from just living. And it's also, I think for me also starts turning you into like, okay, I, now stay at home. I like the, the, I can drive around the corner to, um, um, I'm lucky that I live very close to like right across the street. There's a, a dollar store. Okay? okay. So, um, there's a couple very close places that I drive to if I'm feeling okay. Um, but I don't, I don't drive. Um, besides that, you know, my parents live 45 minutes away from me. I don't get to go visit them very often. And just, you, I am stuck at home. So the longer I'm stuck at home, the more I like being at home, the less I want to leave my home. Um, It just starts this whole like um, feeling like I just don't, uh, I'm content with being home. And I just, if I have to leave, I'm like, I don't want to leave my house. So I started pushing myself to put myself in situations that make me very uncomfortable um, doing things that are hard or scary. Like I went to a kiss concert with my little sister, no. uh, like a month or two ago. And, um, my, still there. Hold on. Okay. There we go. Sorry guys. Yeah. Something happened with the connection but okay so yeah you were at at a concert with your your little sister kiss concert and go ahead yeah and i would usually have not gone um i'd say no because i have some hearing um if noises are too loud i have some sensory problems and it hurts my eardrums so bad so i was really nervous but instead of saying no i was like okay i got these earplugs and then i um they also got me some of those earmuffs that you use when you shoot guns, right? Right, yeah. And so, though, I was like, okay, I'm just going to go. And my little sister said, hey, if you start not feeling good, we'll leave. And, I, and I'm, I I don't want that. I don't want my stress to leave this kid's concert, you know? Right. So that put some pressure on me, but she's been my best friend my whole life. And I'm like, you know what? If she was on the other foot, I'd be like, Karen, if your ears start hurting you, let's go, you know? Right. So I just have to allow her to do this for me, which is hard and not worry about it happening and just be prepared. And I ended up having an amazing time. Yeah. And, but you know, with my brain getting into me, like, what if I have an attack and what if I run her night and you know, yeah, 
I was scared to death, and but I went, and I, I had the most fun I've had in probably a year since I've had this. Yeah, um, awesome. But it's scary because you, like, you, you worry about, like you said, you don't want to let your team down. Yeah. You know, I didn't want to let my sister yeah. down. I didn't want to go into a place that might hurt my ears. I mean, you, you know, like you're going bowling into something that vision is a big part of. Yeah. <laughs> it's putting yourself out there and doing these things or else you're going to end up being depressed and at home and never accomplishing anything, like you said. Yeah. And the need to share <clears throat> For me, like, I haven't even began to touch on the struggles that I've gone through in this last year, even like with my visit to the hospital, um, the mental hospital for five days. Um, and the the mental struggles and, and everything that go along with yeah, it's being disabled and stuff, it's, yeah. it's just a lot. Yeah, it, it just and that's why I try to look at the the bigger picture and try to you know not be so down and you know I realize like you know when I think about whatever suicidal thoughts or dark stuff I I realize like I'm not saying I have this kind of power but it's like I'm on here and I'm I'm being strong and I'm having all these strong people on and there's a lot of people that look to me as there as the strong one of the group and it's like mm-hmm. you never want this like ricochet effect of what happens if you kill yourself and how many people that is that effect because you just don't right. know because you're on here and just mm-hmm. because just because not everyone's coming out and saying hey man you help me or hey because not a lot of us are afraid to share and, and be vulnerable and all that and so you just don't know how many people you impact because a lot of people that are again i have over ten thousand down you know eleven thousand downloads now and you just don't know how many people that are just listening and just would love to do what I'm mm-hmm. doing, but they can't do it because they're still ashamed or they're still whatever, but they're slowly working their way up to it. And if someone like me, who's mm-hmm. an advocate and just is tired and just says, oh, fuck it, I'm done. Who knows if that affects right. that person on the same level. And, and, you know, so it's the bigger picture. I, yeah, because I can tell you like, uh, you know, I have not known you for very long, but this is my first podcast and I was trying to work up the, nerve to put my story out there and not be embarrassed I guess mm-hmm. um, and just not knowing what to do and being scared and nervous and um, you help me uh, feel more relaxed and comfortable about you know sharing my story and feeling like my story is worth sharing you know Good, um, so I I mean I can understand what you're saying. If I continue listening to your podcast in another two months and, and you were to hurt yourself and you're somebody that I look up to, you know, that would be, that would cause me to be like, Oh my gosh, you know? Yeah. Yeah. You just, you don't know. That's a lot of pressure. You don't know who people's superheroes are. You know, you know, you don't know what people, like I said, we're, we're perceived to be the strong ones because we we're speaking up now and we're fighting. But that doesn't, right. that doesn't get, you know, we, we, we kind of delved into it through this and it, you don't know everyone's dark secrets. You don't know how much pain they're in on a daily basis. Uh-uh. It doesn't matter how much, uh-uh. <clears throat> how much money they have, how good looking they are. It, uh-uh. it just does not matter. And, and people are struggling, even if they don't have a disability, they, they have just mental health, which is a disability, but they have just that and they're uh-huh. struggling with uh-huh. whatever. And even though everything in their life yeah. is great to, to us on the surface, but you don't yeah. know what they're dealing with deep down. You don't know what kind of demons they're battling. And, you know, mm-hmm. and that's why I look, you know, I, I never saw, sought out to be some sort of hero or some sort of, even an advocate. Even when someone said it to me the first time, I had to like, I pushed back for a second. I'm like, uh-uh, okay, I guess I am an advocate. But, you know, you, you kind of have to realize yeah. where you are and, and, and what you're doing. Mm-hmm. And, and just because it's not like, oh, you're, you know, like Joe Rogan has a hundred million people listen to his podcast. It's like, it's not, it yeah. doesn't, you don't have to compare yourself to him, even though he's earned what he's got. No. It's just, you know, and again, yeah. people forever told me, you know, why are you going to talk about stuff with disabilities? It's not sexy. It's not something that sells or people care about, but it's like, it's cause there's a lot of people, this shit impacts and a lot of people is affected by this. I don't want, yeah. I don't want to just talk about visual impairment because yes, that's a, that's a very popular disability and it's, it's close to home because I'm in that category, but there's so many people that are affected by so much other shit. And it's all parallel. We're all connected um, and we're all compared to the guy in the wheelchair logo, even on good, you know, the majority of us aren't even in wheelchairs. And so right, we have right. to, we have to look out for each other because every other community tries to do it. 
Um, and, mm -hmm. and, you know, I'm, I'm very genuine about it because I just don't want, I want people to know how many people are, are overcoming and are still struggling even within their overcoming. Um, oh, yeah. And it, like every day. <laughs> yeah. Right? I yeah. mean, it's a struggle every day. And um, the thing the thing that, um, it, the thing is for me is like, not everybody is built to do what you're doing. Not everybody can do what you're doing. Um, we're not, we don't all have, um, the personality or, you know, to do what you're doing, but to, it, it's for me also like, to just try to help other people. And when other people have shared their stories, like on my Meniere's forum or other forums, I've learned from other people that struggle with um, disabilities, like things to do to help me, you know, yeah. like you, you know, Oh, Hey, I have a supplement that might help you. Um, just talking to people that are struggling. Sometimes you can run across a book or just something that impacts you and changes your thinking and, and helps you, you know? Well, that's why so, at the very end, I usually tell the guests like, Hey, you know, give a, give, you know, give someone some help, like some advice on, you know, what is the younger you? Because I think about me all the time and the person who was just bullied mm -hmm. and treated like shit. And even, even more of a current me of just laying on the couch, just sad and angry and just knowing that I have a lot of love to give, but so much damage has been caused that I, sometimes I lose myself and there's parts of me that I'll never get back because of people I've lost yeah. and just whatever carnage mm -hmm. has been done. And, you know, I think about, like I said, a lot of me's and I don't want, like I said, I don't want people to go through this shit. Like it's, it, and I know people will, and it'll go on for a long, mm -hmm. long period of time, but I want as much information and as much people to know that they're not alone because people are killing themselves over less and, yeah. uh, and, and suicide is way up and, you know, COVID uh -huh. hasn't helped any of that, but I, I don't want people to kill themselves because they're gay or because or whatever. And, and mm -hmm. there's a lot of just they just don't want to do it anymore. And I understand it, but we need more fighters because if we don't keep fighting, like we're never going to accomplish anything. We're not going to get anything done. Um, and and that, to me, the disability community is so like I don't even want to say it's in peril, but it, it, it it's it's a struggle because we don't support each other. And we're only, a lot of times when we do support our, we support our cause, our disability, not right. Even when it's chronic illness, a lot of times it's like, well, my chronic illness is fibromyalgia. It's not, you know, whatever other one you want to throw in. And it, we gotta, we can't just, you know, yeah. we can venture out after we come together and show how different we are and how amazing we are. But if we just push back, then we're just showing that we're embarrassed to be us and, and that we don't care about the others. Cause we're all in this shit together. And, yeah, we just, you know. Yeah, and yeah. Part of the beautiful journey that I'm learning, and I don't know if it's because, you know, I've had this time, this downtime, but um, the people are your journey. Like, really, the more people you get to know, you understand that the biggest part of your journey are people. Yeah, pretty much. Like, getting to know different people, getting to know about their disabilities, getting to know about something you never knew about and, and have somebody in your life that sees something differently than you do. I mean, for me, <clears throat> it's becoming that the people, the people are the journey. And, um, like you said, it's not sexy. It's not something that we talk about. It's not something that's cool, but it's something that affects so many people and, nobody talks about it and nobody's real about it, you know? Um, and it needs to happen because yeah, suicide is huge and it's even bigger in the community of people who, you know, uh, with disabilities. I mean, the statistics show. Yeah. And even when I delve into like the homeless community and then the, the addiction part of it, like yeah, we're in all that and the disabled community, mm -hmm. like I, uh, we, we talked about it before, like it doesn't matter what you look like. You're in d disabled people are in every community. There, isn't, mm -hmm. there is not a non, you know, like there's, there's gay people, there's black people, there's women, yeah. there's transgender, like, there's disabled people in every community. And, you know, mm -hmm. we're, there's homeless ones there's short ones, tall ones, like we're, we're in all of them. And so um, mm -hmm. we just have to, 
like I said, there's so many people struggling and, and even people who don't have disabilities, people struggling financially and so on. And it's like, we don't, right. you know, I did an episode on domestic violence with a woman because she, you know, had a story and it's like, it's just a struggle, man. There's a people getting really mm-hmm. fucked over in this world. And if we don't yeah. put a light on it and we continue to just talk about COVID or we continue to just talk about who's dating who and all of that, and we forget about all the other dangers, then we're just, mm-hmm. you know, we're metaphorically blind. No pun intended. Like yeah. we're, we're just, we're blind and we don't, that's why mm-hmm. I, I've, I've always said like the people with the disabilities are always the one, you know, you have this whole, what they call woke culture and all this other garbage. But like, there's, you know, like, you know, I've always said like the people who see the most, see the least and the people who see the least, see the most. And I was referring to people who have sight to sighted people or who don't have sight right. to sighted people. Cause a lot of people who have like a perfect able bodies, they see, they can't see what's in front of them. They're biased, right. they, you know, they vote a certain way just because that's where they were born or they're religious because of this. Right. They don't even really know why, but they don't, they're, right. they're not reasonable. They're not empathetic. Whereas people with disabilities who are considered the broken people are always the ones that are trying to help people. And we're the ones that can yeah. see things that are, that are not as obvious to you, or maybe mm-hmm. not as obvious to the average person, but to us, it's, it's blatant and it's obvious. It's like, yeah, it's right there. Right. Why can't you see that? Clearly this person doesn't uh-huh. care about you. Um, yeah. You know, because I got into so yeah. many arguments, I don't talk about politics, but when people were arguing about yeah. Biden and Trump and it's like, well, Biden's a little less shitty. It's like, but you hear yourself like you. They're all shitty. <laughs> yeah, But do you hear yourself? It's like he has videos of saying he hates pe- like he wanted Social Security to go away and he didn't like people with disabilities. And he has a woman who comes right. on who it does nothing but incarcerate black people and pretends to be fully black, but she's not. And again, I'm not saying Trump was great. I'm just saying there was, cause Trump was so obvious because of his blatant, you know, right. disrespect for people and how, you know, just, he was just so bullish about what he does, but it's like, right. I don't believe people who, uh, pretend to like me and to say all the right things. I hate that shit. Cause right. I, I never, I don't know. Mm-hmm. This has nothing to do with Biden or pol- politics. It just mean period. I don't even like, mm-hmm. I, I, that's why a lot of times I don't even like waiters and waitresses because some of them are so overly nice. It's like, look, you're going to get a tip. Just go away. And yeah, like yeah. at the end, most of the time, like at the end, oh my goodness, I hope you have a great day, blah, blah, blah. Here's your bill. Yeah. Like, yeah, just be real with me. You're getting a tip. Yeah. And you fed me. <laughs> yeah. I, I try to be hardcore honest. I try to not to be too harsh, but I, I you know, life can yeah. suck and you know, not everything is happy go lucky. Um, but mm-hmm. yeah, it, people just, it, again, like they're just so blind to what is real and what is going on mm-hmm. and they're stuck yeah. in, oh my God, mm-hmm. you know, you know, and I go out and people are fighting over masks and who's not wearing masks. It's like, dude, who gives a shit? You're wearing a mask, live with it. Fuck that person. And you're not wearing a mask and they are, who cares? Just live your life. Right. It's too damn short. Mm-hmm. Who cares what they vote? Yeah. Who cares what they're dating? You know, oh, well, yeah. you know, a black guy's dating that white girl. Okay. But she likes black guys. And she's not going to date you even if she wasn't with that guy. Who cares? Who gives a shit? You can't date every person. You can't save every person. Not every person right. is for you. And, you know, yeah. it's just we stop worrying about what other people are doing and just look out for each other. It's just like people don't want to hold doors for each other anymore. There's no respect. And yeah. women are just mm-hmm. selling. Like, it, it's just popular to sell your ass on Instagram and it's terrible. Yeah. It, we're in a society where there's so much horrible shit going on and people are, you know, you see what's going on with the whole, that concert that happened in Houston. It's like, yeah, what, what do you know? A celebrity is on stage performing and people are dying around them and he doesn't care. What do you know? Well, you idolize cyber celebrities and they don't give a shit about you, but yet you are their lifeline. You are the reason why money is flowing in their bank account. They don't care about you. Right. They don't give a shit. And some right. of them do. Don't get me wrong. They're not all bad. But, you know, they don't care yeah. about you, but we don't want to talk about stuff like that. We'd rather talk about you know, whatever else we'd rather talk about who he's dating and when's his new album right. coming out. And, you know, and that's why I, I get on here and I, I have real conversations and it's unfiltered. And I don't, I don't want to have, you know, beat around the bush shit. When I talk about race, I want to talk about it in a real way and real words are going to be used, but in, in, in a mm-hmm. respectful way. And I'm not going right. to, and, you know, like I said, for someone with a disability, like we, our lives aren't sugarcoated. We, we don't belong in an HR room because our lives suck a lot of times and it's hard. And yeah. we don't, we can't always say, Oh, poopy or Oh shoot. Because sometimes we just want to say, Oh fuck. Cause our lives, cause we're in pain emotionally or physically. Right. And you know, we, there's always rules that are trying to be made up for us. And you don't, you don't know what it's like to be us and just understand mm-hmm. that like life may be easier for you. Be grateful. And, um, 
And like I said, you just have to have real conversation and you can't sugarcoat me. This is, you know, they're always worried about what we're teaching the kids while well, we're teaching the kids to be phony and to lie and not mm-hmm. be yourself. And that's why so many of these kids are killing themselves because they're transgendered or gay or disabled or whatever, mm-hmm. because they're told that they're not like everyone else. And you know what? It, who wants to be normal? Who wants to be like everybody's be your own fucking person, own who you mm-hmm. are. And again, I'm saying this to myself, I'm saying this to you and to anybody, but we just got to love ourselves, man. Fucking, we just do. It's corny. It's cheesy. But at, at the end of the day, like, you know, we can't really love anyone else. We don't love ourselves. And, and we have to right. just be honest. And, and like I said, I, I don't know how people judge people when it's like, how do you think you're better than somebody? Like, really? What? Because you pray to God and that person doesn't or, you know, because you're handsome and that person's, you know, maybe not as handsome as you. Yeah, it makes you better. Right. It's like, do you understand? That person probably has a great heart and they will probably be a better boyfriend than you or a better girlfriend than you. It's just that, you know, most mm-hmm. people won't give them a chance because they're shallow. Um, right. And and so, you know, things like love and all that shit just gets passed over because, you know, that's why marriages don't last. You know, that's even that's mm-hmm. like, I thought maybe the gay community would boost it up once they were allowed to get married and it went down because we're like 48, 47% of people stay together because love is not sacred when you're not meant to be together. And so people just right. do shit and have kids and do all kind of nonsense just to just to do it because it's the thing to do. And you know, like I said, when we kind of gloss over real issues, like two million kids going missing a year, we just we just ignore that because we're so worried about a yeah. cold. And I'm not saying COVID is not a problem, but you know what else is a problem? Yeah. Fucking cancer. We haven't cured that. Yeah. AIDS is still a thing, even though we're getting better with that. And you know, but there's so many chronic illnesses and so many. There's so and again, like kids going missing and, and domestic violence, and there's so much shit. The homeless. Why do we have homeless people in a rich country? It makes no sense. Yeah, yeah. But you know, it is what it is. We'll go on this forever. But I do, <laughs> like I said, I think it's funny that like you know, even in the beginning we were talking about how, or off mic we were talking about like you know how it would go and all that, and it's like we're at an hour and forty five minutes, and yeah, it just <laughs> went where it went. And yeah, that's, that's how it yeah. always happens. Hmm. <clears throat> um, yeah. but yeah, is there anything else you want to say before we get the hell out of here? No, I, I, I can't think of anything. I mean, I, I definitely appreciate being on your show. Um, and we did talk about a lot of the problems, but yes, yeah, they trying to just to stay positive and work towards, towards something I think is important. Yeah. And we can do an like episode down the road, doing... maybe, maybe an update just cause I got to know that a lot of stuff is still new to you. So maybe some way down the road yeah, we can do another one, just how you're doing and all your tests and everything will be done at that point. And, uh, yeah. you know, obviously hopefully yeah. for the best, but yeah, I, I want to do some ep- uh, update episodes on some people and obviously you can be one of those people. Um, yeah. Yeah. But yeah, no, I'm very grateful you'd be on. I'm glad we've become friends. And, you know, as I said to you a week ago or whatever that, you know, anything you need, please just, we'll, you want to just someone to talk to I'm around. Um, yeah. You know, like I said, that appreciate we, that. you did the podcast. You didn't have to, we could have talked and you could have never been on and we still could have been friends, but we did. And, right. um, you know, like I said, now we'll get your story out there and like I said, it'll be a little while till it comes out, but I promise you, you'll be the first one to know and, um, just be patient Perfect. with me. And like I said, but I'm, I'm yeah. grateful that you got to tell your story. You're a brave woman. And like I said, you're a great guest. So thank you again. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate it, and it's, it's good to get to know you. Yeah, same here. We'll uh, we'll talk soon, and we can get to know each okay. other without this recording shit. <laughs> Perfect. Awesome. Right, thank you again. Uh-huh. Bye. Bye. All right, guys. Um, yeah, I just wanted to kind of say sorry to the audience. I was kind of, I don't know, just, just in like a down mood today. I don't know. I'll be all right, though. Um, she was really great, and I was happy to have her on, and um yeah, and as she was talking about pets and, you know, bullets right here, and uh, I, I, I had to cough off Mike, and he just looked up like, hey, you're right. <laughs> so um, it's relevant. Uh, but, yeah, guys, thank you again for everything. Um, I'll, uh, I'll try to chip her up and uh, cheer up, and uh, I'll be better in the next episode, I promise. So see you guys next week. Bye. Bye.